All right, folks, this is lesson three in the climate change unit. So this class, we're first gonna look at feedback loops, uh, what they are and how they can affect the climate. And then we'll look at energy transfer in the ocean and the air. So first, uh, a review of climate system. So a climate system is basically a bunch of tiny interactions on Earth together producing the Earth's climate. So the Earth, much like an animal, they need to maintain their body temperature. So the Earth needs to maintain its temperature as well. An animal can achieve this by metabolizing food. So the energy from the food is digested by the animal, used to maintain its body heat. That heat will then be radiated away from the animal. Earth does much the same with the energy from the sun. So once the Earth absorbs energy from the sun, it heats up its surface. Also, the Earth will radiate energy into space, thereby keeping an equilibrium. A feedback loop is a process in which the final result will go back and affect the inputs of the system. An example in real life will be, let's say, a restaurant. Customers can leave bad reviews for a restaurant. And if other customers see those reviews, they are less likely to go to that restaurant. So the company can then do something about this. They can either improve their um, service or food or nothing. So if they improve, the reviews probably will become better. So attracting more customers. So this is a self-correcting system. In science, there are two types of feedback loops. The first one is a positive feedback loop. A positive feedback loop is a system in which a result will be amplified and enhanced. Uh, for example, let's say a student answers questions in class. The teacher then gives compliments to that student. That student is very happy with what just transpired. So this student will likely answer more questions and getting more compliments as a result. So a positive feedback and amplification process. A negative feedback loop is a system that tries to maintain an equilibrium. So for example, a student engages in disruptive behavior, the student then gets yelled at by the teacher then the student will less likely disrupt the class because nobody likes to be yelled at. So this is a self-correcting system that always seeks to eliminate change and stay the same. Okay, here's an example. In this picture, it kind of describes how your body regulates your temperature. So let's say it is very cold outside. So the cells and the neurons on your skin detects cold temperature. They send a signal to your brain, which then sends another signal to your muscles telling your muscles to shiver. The act of shivering increases the body temperature, restoring the temperature balance. Okay, so this is an example of negative feedback, okay? They try to stay at equilibrium and no change occurs. When it is hot outside, your cells will experience a hot stimulus and sends that to the brain. Your brain then sends another signal to your sweat glands. You then start sweating. The act of sweating evaporates heat from the body, thereby reducing your body's temperature and again, restoring the balance. So here is another example of negative feedback. All right, so in this example, childbirth, the brain stimulates the pituitary gland, a part of your brain to excrete a hormone called oxytocin. Now this hormone goes into the uterus of the mother and what it does is it pushes the baby out. So when the head of the baby is pushed against the cervix, 
This stimulates the brain to release more oxytocin, which contracts the uterus even more, which pushes the baby's head even more, which releases more oxytocin. So this is a self-amplifying process. This is an example of positive feedback. All right, so the Earth receives energy from the sun in the form of electromagnetic radiation. Now in the physics unit, we talked about what that is. That is basically light with different wavelengths. And one of those wavelengths is visible light. Now, heat that you detect is a form of infrared radiation, which is one of the radiations that um, is in the electromagnetic radiation. So there are three different ways in which this magnetic uh, electromagnetic radiation can be transmitted. There's radiation, conduction, and convection. So in the picture, that explains the three different processes. Radiation is light moving in space. There is no contact at all. Convection is the heat moving in a fluid, in a circle. And conduction is heat transfer through contact. So here's another picture illustrating the three types of radiation. The sun radiates energy by traveling through space. Okay, convection occurs in the air. Warm air rises as cool air sinks. And uh, conduction occurs on the ground. The ground can transmit heat to other parts of the ground. And in the atmosphere, when the sun shines, this convection occurs with the air. And this results in little conveyor belts of air moving in different parts of the world. This creates the winds. And the differences in pressure can also create different climates. So the wind patterns are a result of heat from the sun. In the oceans, we have something called thermohaline circulation. Thermal meaning heat, haline means salt. So what that is, is the flow of water in the world's ocean driven by differences in water temperature and how salty that water is. So ocean currents are also affected by the climate. Now, when water moves towards the poles and the poles being cold, the water will also get cold, all right? And when water freezes as ice near the Arctic or the Antarctic, ice is pure water the salt will be left behind. So the water near the poles, they're saltier and denser than normal. And denser cold water will then sink to the bottom of the ocean, which pushes warm water up. So this creates a circulation of water, like in the picture illustrated. The fact that a current is warm or cold has drastic effects on the climate nearby. For example, in the picture on the right, you can see the Gulf Stream in red. And that stream will carry itself up into the Arctic and back down again near the coastlines of North and South America. Now, red representing a warm stream going upward north, and a blue stream is a cold one going south. The climate of Canada is typically very cold. Canadian winters are extremely harsh. Sometimes it is almost as cold as the Arctic. If you ever go to Iceland, um, that country is located near the North Pole. It is extremely north. You can see auroras in Iceland. However, Iceland is not that cold. If you look at the climate graph, um, we learned how to read a climate graph in the last class. The average temperature of Iceland is around 5 degrees. It's not very hot. Granted, in the summer, is the around 10 degrees, okay, but in the winter, it doesn't dip much below zero. 
Okay, you don't see negative 10 degrees very often in Iceland, whereas you see negative 10 degrees a lot more in Canada. But Canada is more south than Iceland. This has a lot to do with the type of ocean current that they receive. Iceland receives a lot of warm current from the south, thereby heating the climate. Canada receives a lot of current from the Arctic, which is cold, which makes Canada also very cold. And the sea surface temperatures, we can also monitor that. And sometimes there are anomalies. That means variations from the norm. Now, during a normal year, a neutral year, the West trade wind is the wind that carries moisture from North America to Asia over the Pacific Ocean. That wind is the Western uh, trade wind. This is perfectly balanced with the wind coming from the Eastern Pacific. Okay. And the storm is usually created in Asia, as the picture would suggest. So that's a normal year. However, on some years, anomalies occur. For example, in this picture here, the west trade wind is a lot weaker. It's been weakened. As a result, the east wind is stronger. And if it is stronger, the storm that is supposed to be on the Asian continent is blown across the Pacific and it arrives in North America. Okay, this, we, we, this is what we call El Nino. Okay, when you have El Nino, North America becomes more wet. The opposite can occur in some drier years. So the west trade wind becomes a lot stronger than the east trade wind. So we win the tug of war. We push the storm away into Asia. As a result, we get less uh, water in North America. So that becomes dry years. So that is La Nina. Uh, uh, sorry, La Nina. I can't say that properly. So you have El Nino and La Nina. El Nino means we are wet in North America. La Nina means we are dry in North America. Okay, so in this picture, that summarizes the situation here. On the left, you have La Nina. Um, you have that dry patch near the border of Mexico and the United States because the storm has been pushed away into Asia because of a strong west trade wind. In years where it is El Nino, the North American continent, especially in the uh, southern United States and Mexico, it's a lot wetter. There's a lot more rain because the west trade wind becomes weak. The east trade wind pushes the storm into North America. OK, so these are anomalies. So we get energy from the sun but we don't absorb all of that energy. So of the 100% energy, only around half of it is absorbed by the land. Some of them are reflected by the atmosphere, some by the clouds, some by the surface. You don't need to memorize this diagram. You just have to know that we don't absorb all of the energy from the sun. There is an energy budget, okay? So how much energy we reflect, it really depends on whether the albedo is high or not on the surface it was shining on. Like I mentioned before, ice and snow, because of their white color, they have extremely high albedo. They are really good reflectors of light, okay? So they look bright in the wintertime because they are reflecting a lot of light. Now, if you think about it, if you reflect a lot of light, then that electromagnetic radiation is not being used to heat up the ground. So this is a cooling effect, okay? 
problem um, if the ice starts to melt and it is melting. If the ice starts to melt, you have less ice. If you have less ice, then you have weaker albedo. If the albedo effect is weakened, you reflect less light. That means you absorb more light. And by doing that, you raise the temperature. If you raise the temperature, you will melt even more ice, which results in even weaker albedo, which raises the temperature more. You see where this is going? This is another example of a positive feedback loop. And this is posing to be a serious problem. Climate change is the most severe in the Arctic, where there's lots of ice. A lot of ice is being melted from the Arctic. And as a result, the Arctic is heating up faster than the rest of the planet because they're losing its albedo effect. So in the picture below, check out the ice cover in the summer of two different months. Now keep in mind that these are both summertime in 1979 compared to 2007. A significant portion of ice is lost. It's been melted by the heat that we accumulated over the years. So we are losing more and more Arctic ice, which heats up the earth more and more. Soon we might reach a, um, in a point of no return where the albedo effect and positive feedback loop kicks in and it accelerates the heating process even further. By that time, it will be really difficult to stop or slow climate change. All right, so in the picture here, in the two diagrams, this kind of summarizes the albedo and feedback loop. So on the left, you have the warming effect. So when the ice melts, less sunlight is reflected by that ice, which increases the temperature of the earth, which heats up more ice, melts the ice, which heats up the temperature even more. So this is what happens when the climate increases. A positive feedback loop would occur. Now, a cooling effect happens as well. And many times during the Earth's history, ice ages form. So that's also uh, because of the feedback loop. So when you form more ice, you reflect more light from the sun. And if you do that, the temperature cools which forms even more ice, which freezes uh, uh, more water, reflecting more light, cooling the planet. So both of these effects are positive feedback and positive feedback will just make it worse and worse and worse. Okay, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now we fear that in the Canadian Arctic or even the tundra, this is already happening. We learned about permafrost in the last lesson. There's permafrost in the Canadian tundra. From the name, perma means permanent. So these ice are not supposed to melt. The soil are supposed to be frozen forever. But the problem is climate change is slowly releasing, uh, sorry, is slowly melting that permafrost and trapped within that ice are methane. And methane is a gas that is also a greenhouse gas. If you melt the permafrost, you release a lot of methane into the air, which heats up the air, which melts more permafrost. So this is another positive feedback loop. This will have tremendous effects on our climate. So it is very important that we limit the scope of climate change so that these positive feedback loops do not take over. If they do, our lives will become a lot more difficult. All right, so this concludes the end of this class. We basically talked about what feedback loops are, how climate can depend on feedback loops, and how a positive feedback loop on, uh, on climate can really screw up our planet. Okay, Venus is such example of a positive feedback. Those clouds trap more heat, which makes it warmer, which releases more clouds.
Uh, and we also learn about thermal haline circulation, how the ocean can redistribute heat around the globe. And that explains certain climates of certain regions. Okay, Norway and Iceland and UK being north, it's not actually colder than Toronto being more south because of that reason. And also heat is distributed in the air through convection. All right, this is, this, this is it folks. Um, El Nino and La Nina are just anomalies in these patterns. So these are rare events that happen once every few years. All right, this is it folks. If you have any questions, again, send me an email.